Welcome to the Politics of the Middle East, lecture number one. The first step when we enter a new object of study is to define it. Now, even at this very early stage of the subject, we already encounter a problem not only because what we mean by Middle East has been under continuous change during the last two centuries, but also because the name, the very name of the region, Middle East, and the understanding of what we mean by Middle East have not been the product of indigenous views, that is, the product of the conceptualization of people of these regions, but the result of foreign constructs, to be more precise, imperial constructs. Nevertheless, we will start by trying to define geographically what the Middle East is contemporarily. The Middle East is commonly delineated as comprising the region of the Fertile Crescent, the Persian Gulf, and the Arabian Peninsula. The Fertile Crescent is a sort of crescent or boomerang-shaped region, which was home to some of the earliest human civilizations. It spans across modern-day Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Egypt. It was also known as the cradle of civilization. This area was in fact the birthplace of a number of technological innovations, including writing, the will, agriculture, and the use of irrigation. So all these things emerge here in this region, not in the West, not in Europe. All this part that I've been um, mentioning, the part of the Middle East um, delineated by the Fertile Crescent, the Persian Gulf, and the Arabian Peninsula, is called the Mashrik, which in Arabic means the East or the place where the sun rises. But generally, the definition of the Middle East also includes the western part, the Maghreb, which is the region of North Africa, including Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya as well. So as you see, we have a sort of flexible definition, even geographical, of the Middle East. And this depends on how different scholars and observers use this concept, this idea of the Middle East. This region also includes what is going to be in our subject the main topic of discussion, that is the region that spot here in the map as Israel and Palestine. So here it is, the region known as Historic Palestine, on which the State of Israel was established in 1948. Nowadays, Israel occupies militarily the region of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. As you can see, this compound, Israel-Palestine or Palestine-Israel, their neighbors are on the west, Jordan, on the north, Syria and Lebanon, on the south, Egypt, and further south, Saudi Arabia. This is going to be the focus of our subject, and we are going to um, discuss the modern history of this part of the planet how historic Palestine became eventually the state of Israel and why there is still a violent ongoing conflict
between the state of Israel and the Palestinian people. One of the biggest myths about the Israel-Palestine conflict is that it's been going on for centuries, all about ancient religious hatreds. In fact, while religion is involved, conflict's mostly about two groups of people who claim the same land. And it really only goes back about a century, the early 1900s. Around then, the region along the eastern Mediterranean we now call Israel-Palestine, been under Ottoman rule for centuries, it was religiously diverse, including mostly Muslims and Christians, also a small number of Jews who lived generally in peace. It was changing in two important ways. First, more people in the region were developing a sense of being not just ethnic Arabs, but Palestinians, a distinct national identity. At the same time, not so far away in Europe, more Jews were joining a movement called Zionism, which said that Judaism was not just a religion, but a nationality, one that deserved a nation of its own. And after centuries of persecution, many believed a Jewish state was their only way of safety and saw their historic homeland in the Middle East as their best hope for establishing it. In the first decades of the 20th century, tens of thousands of European Jews moved there. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And British and French empires carved up the Middle East, the British taking control of a region it called the British Mandate for Palestine. At first, the British allowed Jewish immigration. But as more Jews arrived, settling into farming communities, tension between Jews and Arabs grew. Both sides committed acts of violence, and by the 1930s, the British began limiting Jewish immigration. In response, Jewish militias formed to fight both the local Arabs and to resist British rule. Then came the Holocaust, leading many more Jews to flee Europe for British Palestine and galvanizing much of the world in support of a Jewish state. In 1947, as sectarian violence between Jews and Arabs there grew, the United Nations approved a plan to divide British Palestine into two separate states, one for Jews, Israel, and one for Arabs, Palestine. The city of Jerusalem, where Jews, Muslims, and Christians all have holy sites, was to become a special international zone. The plan was meant to give Jews a state, to establish Palestinian independence, and to end the sectarian violence that the British could no longer control. But the Jews accepted the plan, and they declared independence as Israel. But Arabs throughout the region saw the UN plan as just more European colonialism trying to steal their land. Many of the Arab states, who had just recently won independence themselves, declared war on Israel in an effort to establish a unified Arab Palestine where all of British Palestine had been. The new state of Israel won the war. But in the process, they pushed well past their borders under the UN plan, taking the western half of Jerusalem and much of the land that was to have been part of Palestine. They also expelled huge numbers of Palestinians from their homes, creating a massive refugee population whose descendants today number about 7 million. At the end of the war, Israel controlled all of the territory except for Gaza, which Egypt controlled, and the West Bank, named because it's west of the Jordan River, which Jordan controlled. This was the beginning of the decades-long Arab-Israeli conflict. During this period, many Jews in Arab-majority countries fled or were expelled, arriving in Israel. Then something happened to transform the conflict. In 1967, Israel and the neighboring Arab states fought another war. When it ended, Israel had seized the Golan Heights from Syria, the West Bank from Jordan, and both Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. Israel was now occupying the Palestinian territories, including all of Jerusalem and its holy sites. This left Israel responsible for governing the Palestinians, a people it had fought for decades. In 1978, Israel and Egypt signed the U.S.-brokered Camp David Accords. Shortly after that, Israel gave Sinai back to Egypt as part of the peace treaty. At the time, this was hugely controversial in the Arab world. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat was assassinated in part because of outrage against it. But it marked the beginning of the end of the wider Arab-Israeli conflict. Over the next few decades, the other Arab states gradually made peace with Israel, even if they never signed formal peace treaties. But Israel's military was still occupying the Palestinian territories of the West Bank and Gaza. And this is when the conflict became an Israeli-Palestinian struggle. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, which had formed in the 1960s to seek a Palestinian state, fought against Israel, including through acts of terrorism. Initially, the PLO claimed all of what had been British Palestine, meaning it wanted to end the state of Israel entirely. 
Fighting between Israel and the PLO went on for years, even including a 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon to kick the group out of the The stillness of the ceasefire in southern Lebanon was shattered today by the sound of guns, bombs, and planes. The PLO later said it would accept dividing the land between Israel and Palestine, but the conflict continued. As all of this was happening, something dramatic was changing in the Israel-occupied Palestinian territories. Israelis were moving in. These people were called settlers, and they made their homes in the West Bank and Gaza, but the Palestinians wanted them or not. Some moved for religious reasons, some because they want to claim the land for Israel, some just because housing is cheap, often subsidized by the Israeli government. Some settlements are cities with thousands of people. Others are small communities deep into the West Bank. If you've always felt a deep yearning for Jerusalem, now is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity not only to stand within its gates, but also to build the home of your dreams there. The settlers are followed by soldiers to guard them, and the growing settlements force Palestinians off of their land and divide communities. Short term, they make the occupation much more painful for Palestinians. Long term, by dividing up Palestinian land, they make it much more difficult for the Palestinians to ever have an independent state. Today, there are several hundred thousand settlers in occupied territory, even though the international community considers them illegal. By the late 1980s, Palestinian frustration exploded into the Intifada, which is the Arabic word for uprising. It began with mostly protests and boycott, but soon became violent. Israel responded with heavy force. A couple hundred Israelis, over a thousand Palestinians died in the first Intifada. Around the same time, a group of Palestinians in Gaza considered the PLO too secular, too compromise-minded, created Hamas, a violent extremist group dedicated to Israel's destruction. By the early 1990s, it's clear that Israelis and Palestinians have to make peace. The leaders from both sides signed the Oslo Accords. This is meant to be the big first step toward Israel maybe someday withdrawing from the Palestinian territories and allowing an independent Palestine. The Oslo Accords established the Palestinian Authority allowing Palestinians a little bit of freedom to govern themselves in certain areas. Hardliners on both sides opposed the Oslo Accords. Members of Hamas launched suicide bombings to try to sabotage the process. The Israeli right protest peace talks with ralliers calling Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin a traitor and a Nazi. Not long after Rabin signs the second round of Oslo Accords, the far-right Israeli shoots him to death in Tel Aviv. But this violence showed how extremists on both sides can use violence to derail peace, keep a permanent conflict going as they seek the other side's total destruction. That's a dynamic that's been around ever since. Negotiations meant to hammer out the final details on peace drag on for years, and the big Camp David summit in 2000 comes up empty. Palestinians come to believe peace isn't coming, rise up in a second intifada, this one much more violent than the first. By the time it wound down a few years later, about a thousand Israelis and 3,200 Palestinians had died. But the second intifada really changes the conflict. Israelis become much more skeptical that Palestinians will ever accept peace or that it's even worth trying. Israeli politics shift right, the country builds walls and checkpoints to control Palestinians' movements. They're not really trying to solve the conflict anymore, they just manage it. The Palestinians are left feeling like negotiating didn't work, and violence didn't work, and that they're stuck under an ever-growing occupation with no future as a people. That year, Israel withdraws from Gaza. Hamas gains power, but splits from the Palestinian Authority in a short civil war, dividing Gaza from the West Bank. Israel puts Gaza under a suffocating blockade, and unemployment rises to 40%. This is the state of the conflict as we know it today. It's relatively new, and it's unbearable for Palestinians. In the West Bank, more and more settlements are smothering Palestinians, often respond with protests and sometimes with violence, but most just want normal lives. In Gaza, Hamas and other violent groups have periodic wars with Israel. The fighting overwhelmingly kills Palestinians, including lots of civilians. In Israel itself, most people have become apathetic. For the most part, the occupation keeps the conflict relatively removed from their daily lives, with moments of brief but horrible violence. There's little political will for peace. No one really knows where the conflict goes from here. Maybe a third intifada, maybe the Palestinian Authority collapses. 
But everyone agrees that things as they are now can't last much longer. Israel's occupation of the Palestinians is too unstable to last, and that unless something dramatic changes, whatever comes next will be much worse. Let's look into some basic Middle East statistical data. Approximately the Middle East population is 560 million. Arabic is the dominant language and there are only three non-Arab countries, Turkey, Israel and Iran. In Turkey, the language is Turkish in Israel, Hebrew, and in Iran, is Farsi. Islam is numerically the biggest religion in the Middle East, though the majority of Muslims reside outside the Middle East, mainly in Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and India. There are large concentrations of Christian sects in Egypt, particularly the Coptic Church and in Syria and Lebanon, mainly the Greek Orthodox Church. Also, there are small minorities of Christian sects in Israel and in Palestine. There are smaller religious communities in the Middle East, Jewish in Israel, and the Baha'i and the Zoroastrians, the Yazidi, and others. Historically, and in terms of regime formation, what the Middle Eastern societies have in common is pretty much what the non-European world have in common. That is, this region of the world was subjected to the same historical processes from imperial rule to colonial rule and then to a very eclectic combination of liberal and authoritarian rule during the independence stage after World War II. From the viewpoint of our own subject, we are going to look very briefly into the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic Caliphates, but mainly we are going to focus on the late stage of the Ottoman Empire in Palestine and then on the British mandate in Palestine that is as part of the colonial rule in the region. And at the last part of the subject, we are going to focus on what took place in Palestine after World War II, that is the establishment of the State of Israel and the continuing conflict with the Palestinian people. When we look at the Middle East economies, what we see here is a very mixed picture. On the one hand, we have some countries with high rates of economic development, alongside countries suffering from economic stagnation, inflation and unemployment. So, for instance, you can see in this table, the first one about the GDP, um, the um, countries that are um, highly ranked are those um, generally called oil countries, Qatar, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and also Oman. Uh, just for comparison, if you look at the GDP per capita, Australia, for instance, uh, and these are 2016 um, stats. Australia had almost $50,000 American dollars a year. And so you can see it would have been only after Bahrain here in this table. Now, apart from these oil countries in the Middle East, uh, there are three other uh, stable or strong economies uh, relatively, which are Israel, Turkey and also Tunisia. Now, on the other hand, if you look at those countries or regions that are placed 
uh, uh, lastly in this table, you'll find Palestine uh, for Syria during these years that the, the war the war was still ongoing. Uh, we didn't have even uh, data. Um, and on the other hand, when you look at the unemployment rates, again, you can see that the oil countries are ranked very highly as well as Israel. And on the other hand, if you look at Palestine, um, in 2016, with an unemployment rate of 25%, which is very high. This table um, um, gives a measure of what is called the Global Competitive Index, again 2016. Uh, this index um, um, gives an idea of um, short and medium-term economic prosperity. Now, out of 138 states, you can see that there are a few Middle Eastern countries that are ranked quite highly, uh, like some of the oil countries. And again, um, we have Israel, even in the, in the third place, among the Middle Eastern countries, 24th uh, global ranking, which is still very, very highly ranked. But on the other hand, if you look at, again, Palestine and Syria, we don't even have available uh, data to measure economic prosperity. So again, this gives you an indication of how mixed is the picture of economic stability and prosperity uh, in the Middle East. I said at the beginning of the lecture that the way we understand what the Middle East is and of what countries and region it is comprised have not been the product of indigenous or local views, but the result of foreign imperial constructs. So let's try and unpack this statement. To begin with, since medieval times in Europe, the term Orient was used to identify a wide region, including Arabic-speaking countries, Turkey, Iran, India, and even China. The point is that to define a region in terms of East or Orient means that these definitions derive from the point of view of Europe, because what lies at the East or at the Orient of Europe are those regions. Now, the term Orient derives from the Latin Orients, which means where the sun rises. In addition, the very term Middle East was coined by an American, Alfred Mahan, who was an American maritime historian. In 1902, published an article in which for the first time he uses the phrase Middle East. According to Mahan, the Middle East was the region between the Suez Canal and Singapore. But his interest was to identify the significance of the region for Britain in terms of a region of the world that can secure a safe route to India. Now, during World War I, the term Middle East gained more circulation as the region itself was a battlefield, as we will discuss in a couple of weeks. And later on, because of the discovery of large reserves of oil. Now, importantly, at that time, the peoples from the area, from what was began to be called Middle East, never identified themselves as being from the Middle East, something that is obviously common nowadays. Now, the problem is not just about how we define regions or things, but more comprehensively about how the West, how Europe as interpret the Orient, what they call the Orient, 
particularly during modern times. In fact, the way that the West has perceived and represented the cultures and the societies from what they call the Orient eventually became the way the Orient, these peoples from these regions, have been defined in the eyes of the members of Western societies. And later on, because of the supremacy of Western empire, also in the eyes of the world. Now, what we need to understand here is this is one major obstacle in the study of a subject, in our case, the study of the Middle East, because there is here an historical mediation of Western ideas and Western interests that became imbued in Western scholarship about the Middle East. So for us, the big question at this stage is how we study the Middle East, its people, its societies, their histories, without, or at the time we are conscious of, the Western mediation that construed the ideas, the concepts about the Middle East. You may ask yourself why the Western mediation about understanding the Middle East is an obstacle when we come to study the Middle East. Why we should be careful of the mediation of Western scholarship. The answer is that the West has always perceived Middle Eastern societies and cultures, including Arab societies and cultures, as primitive and inferior. Now, think about this. Is it really necessary to state that the same measure of caution should be applied when it comes to the ways that white Australia through its scholarship, as used in the past and uses in some cases still in the present to represent Aboriginal history and cultures. So in studying the Middle East or Aboriginal cultures or any other non-Western society that has suffered from colonization and empire, we must resist the temptation of following blindly Western authorship in terms of how regions and peoples are conceptualized, understood, and represented for others. What does it mean not to follow blindly scholarship? It means to follow it critically. Colonialism has been during the last 600 years or so, the major force that Europeans have used to impose their conception of life, and no less importantly, their economic interest on those peoples that they have colonized. This historical fact is very important, crucial to take into account when we come to study a region of the world that have suffered from European colonialism and imperialism. In order to be able to form a critique of the relations between the West and the Orient, we are going to adopt from the work of Palestinian American scholar, Edward Said. Edward Said coined the term Orientalism. And in the nutshell, Orientalism is the word Edward Said used to describe how the West form an idea of the East, of the Orient, 
and how these ideas influence our perceptions of the people and the societies of this region. For some reason, when we think of the Middle East, of the kind of people that live there, of the landscapes and the ways people live in that region, we have an already preconceived notion of them and their ways of life, of how they act, on what they believe, even if we never have been there or met anyone from there. So the question that Said answer is, how is this even possible? Said answers this question by saying that the way we acquire knowledge about the peoples of the Middle East and more generally about all other societies that are not Western societies is not innocent or objective, but it follows a process that reflects existing ideas and interests. For many years, Europe and later the United States have been forming images of the Middle East that distort the actual reality of those places and those peoples. In his book Orientalism, Said analyzed a large corpus of authors who wrote about the Middle East, works of art representing situations from the Middle East, travel books, poetry, novels, philosophy books, and other texts that together form during many years a sort of database about the Middle East. Through this analysis, Edward Said was able to deduce a code that established the West and the East as binary opposites. Said based his approach on Michel Foucault's notions of discourse and discursive formation, and also on the analysis of relationships between power and knowledge, and the idea that representations of the world are always influenced by the systems of power in which they are located. Now, this sort of code or lens that Said found through his analysis of all these Western imageries and texts through which we see the part of the world that the West come to conquer and colonize, Said calls Orientalism. So again, Orientalism is a sort of lens through which we look at other people, particularly those from the Orient, those who are not from our Western culture. The images that for centuries the West has been forming about the Middle East rely on an understanding of the world where the West is the norm, the center, the standard of life, and that we all should aspire towards. And the East is the abnormal, the exotic, the foreign. The Orient that Orientalism represents for us is an Oriental fantasy. Look at these pictures, a fictional description of the Orient. Everything about these images and text draws on exaggeration of certain aspects of the Middle East societies. This fascination with the Orient, for instance, the hypersexualization of women, the barbarity of men, unusual foods, mysticism, magic, including in modern cinema, forms a full spectrum of strangeness that in fact serves to reinforce the West's own 
moral conception of itself. Let us read a quote from Edward Said's book, Orientalism. Orientalism is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and the Occident. Thus, a very large mass of writers, among whom are poets, novelists, philosophers, political theorists, economists, and imperial administrators have accepted the basic distinction between East and West as the starting point for elaborate accounts concerning the Orient, its people, customs, mind, destiny, and so on. The phenomenon of Orientalism, as I study it here, deals principally not with a correspondence between Orientalism and Orient, but with the internal consistency of Orientalism and its ideas about the Orient, despite or beyond any correspondence or lack thereof with the real Orient. From the beginning of Western speculation about the Orient, the one thing the Orient could not do was represent itself. Evidence of the Orient was credible only after it had passed through the refining fire of the Orientalist work. Edward Said, Palestinian intellectual, literary theorist, historian of the colonial narrative. Said explained how colonialism works, not just through armies, but through literature. Not just through conquest, but through anthropology. Not just through oppression, but justified through narrative. He showed how the West painted a picture of the East. Snake charmers, belly dancers, thieves, the exotic, the sensual, the depraved. Said saw it in 19th century Western literature, and you can see it across modern culture. Switch on the news, read the newspapers, look at the images. What stories are you being told? Us versus them. The rational versus the irrational. Civilization versus barbarism. Africans, corrupt despots, starving victims. Latin Americans, drug lords, football players, dictators. Arabs, terrorists, misogynists. Asians, software engineers, religious fanatics. How does it feel to be fixed, captured, free? Think of Orientalism as a lens. Use it when you read the media. Spot the stereotype. Decode the fiction. Unlearn the myth. Then again, to sum up, Orientalism is a mode of Western discourse and set of practices for representing the peoples from the Middle East. A discourse of the powerful about the powerless through text, institutions, forms of government. Orientalism is also a style of thought based on an ontological distinction between East and West, where the West is superior and sets a radical difference that creates tension and conflict. Orientalism is a Western style to have actual authority over the Orient and exercise civilizational 
tutelage. For instance, Let's have a short read that is quote from Lord Evelyn Baron Cromer, who was Consul General in Egypt in late 19th century, a period of time that Said includes in his analysis. So Lord Cromer, as Consul in Egypt, said, The European is a close reasoner. His statements of fact are devoid of ambiguity. He is a natural logician. His trained intelligence works like a piece of mechanism. The mind of the Oriental, on the other hand, like his picturesque streets, is eminently wanting in symmetry. His reasoning is of the most slipshod description. Although the ancient Arabs acquire in a somewhat higher degree that sciences of dialectics, their descendants are singularly deficient in the logical faculty. Now, this is very representative of the sort of text that Said encountered in his analysis in Orientalism. Actually, Orientalism has done to us, and still does to us, in the way we think about other people. To begin with, during so many years, Orientalist images and conceptualization have fed into our formation and have helped to define Europe as the antithesis of the Orient and think what does it means to think of another as the antithesis of yourself. This means that we tend to anticipate the perception of Middle East people, a false one, what they are, how they live. It sets the West, in our case, a culture that we more or less uh, belong to, as the norm, a standard of human life, which means that any other culture and society is not. And the bottom line is perhaps that true Orientalism, the Orient, that other, cannot ever be a point of empathy. So, in fact, dehumanization is inherent in Orientalism. Think of the way that Australians think about asylum seekers that are sent a throw into detention camps in Manus Island, Nauru and other places. Many of us tend to think of those people as criminals, rapists, murderers, terrorists, where in fact all they are are people trying to find another country where they can live without being persecuted. That perception that we have of these others is what Said called an Orientalist perception. Now, where racism stands in relation to Orientalism? Racism is expressed in the social practices and institutions that enact the oppression of others while Orientalism is the more cultural predisposition that frames the creation and reproduction of racism. Now, just to give you a last statement about Orientalism, I believe that the bottom line is that Orientalism is not just a Western style about interpreting the Orient or the other, but in fact, also to have authority over the Orient and the other. This is the end of lecture number one.